Hmm? Thank you uh, very much. I would like to thank Felix Greve for uh, his work and all the team from the center uh, and uh, for the organization of this extraordinary conference. And my warmest thank you to Professor Hagen Huber for inviting me to deliver this keynote talk. I, uh, I thank also all the uh, four mothers and fathers whose existence allowed me to be here today. And I dedicate my talk to my students. As a, with many artifacts of uh, human cultures across history, the widespread use of and the interactions with computers does not imply widespread knowledge of how they operate. By knowledge how they operate, I'm not referring to the know-how of those who use computers or other computational devices such as our precious mobile phones. I am rather uh, talking about what is called the maker's knowledge in the Western tradition that goes back to Plato's dialogues. Implications of this fact range from ethical, economical, and political issues, such as data privacy, algorithmic bias, software ownership, and surveillance, to cognitive, educational, and psychosocial questions about how the use of computers transform our cognitive and social abilities, and more specific, more specific issues, such as why and how scientific practices are more or less affected by the pervasive use of computers and the advances in computer science. In the field of mathematics, um, a prominent testimony of what was once called the computer revolution was the introduction of computers in practices of proving. Here I have a quote from Sir uh, Michael Atia, field medalist, and a paper in, in this paper called Mathematics and the Computer Revolution from 84, that was published again in 2016. Uh, Atia talks about the computer revolution in mathematics as a Orwellian <laughs> sort of, a, of, um, of event, historical event that it was challenging. And then in 2016, when he when this was republished, the paper was republished, he said that it is still a threat to mathematics, the, uh, these computer revolution or what we call today computer assisted mathematics. Um, so in the field of mathematics, a prominent testimony of what was once called the uh, computer revolution was the introduction of computers in practices of proving theorems, a fact with historical and philosophical consequences demanding continual and interdisciplinary examination. In this talk, I am going to tell you about recent developments, developments in my research concerning this famous um, case of computer-assisted mathematics, the proof of the four-color theorem that Professor Hagen Gruber just told you, I wrote my PhD dissertation on it. But what I did there was to make uh, an assessment of Wittgensteinian from a Wittgensteinian perspective of the uh, philosophical discussions surrounding uh, the proof. What I will, what I'm doing now in this, this is, these are the recent developments of my uh, research is going back to the past and looking at the history of the theorem and you will know in a minute why. So the general aim of the project I am developing is to illuminate one vital dimension of that rather multifaceted revolution in mathematics, the interplay of the diagrammatic and the algorithmic aspects of mathematical practices. But why this proof? I offer you some reasons here. First of all, because it was the first original mathematical result produced with uh, a, a computer assistance. It is not very difficult to understand the problem, right? Um, it provoked many uh, desperate reactions, as I said. It is still mentioned nowadays whenever one talks about computer assisted mathematics, but mostly there is still a lot of work to do. <laughs> as you will see. And uh, 
And how? How would such a study case help answering the historical and philosophical questions engendered by computer-assisted mathematics, uh, such as how the use of computers impact the achievement and the transmission of mathematical knowledge. When I talk about mathematical uh, computer-assisted mathematics, what I am referring to is an entire field of research that sometimes is called also experimental mathematics. There's a lot of uh, discussion about that. But the point is that computers have many uses in mathematical practices. And I am focusing here in this specific case of computer assisted proofs, not computer generated proofs that are proofs entirely generated by computers. Uh, so this is just so you have an idea of what it is, the field of um, computer assisted mathematical practices and the focus of my research now. So uh, I, I divided into four parts. I'll try to be super fast in the first one, which is the, the presentation of the problem and um, tell you again quickly about how these philosophical, um, how the origins of the philosophical debate that I have analyzed uh, elsewhere is very problematic and why a change in perspective is, um, is needed, or so I understand it, okay? And then I will finish with some reflections and I will talk about women too. Um, oops. So the question of whether or not only four colors suffice to color any map in such a way that no region sharing a border is given the same color was first advanced in 1852 by a lawyer who was also a geography uh, teacher. He was in South Africa coloring a map of England. And then he thought, hmm, he asks, can, can, I, can I color the map of England only with four color in such a way that uh, adjacent regions will not receive the same color? And then he did it. And he said, well, does it, does it go also with all maps? And then he wrote to his brother who was uh, Augustus de Morgan um, student, and then it was de Morgan, it was Augustus de Morgan that uh, got interested in this and then started to write letters and ask everyone about the, if they had a solution to the problem and stuff. Uh, but, and, and, but, 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 but the first tentative proof was offered only in uh, 8079, but was proven wrong 11, 11 years uh, later. So the history of the four color theorem led to the development of, in several mathematical fields, many topology, graph theory, and combinatorics, and engaged many brilliant minds in trying to prove it, such as Charles Saunders Peirce, and even the French poet, Paul Valéry. Now, for the sake of brevity, I will only present to you those ideas or the mathematical ideas that are essential for understanding the problems I am interested in and why I consider them interesting. So a crucial, uh, a crucial aspect of uh, the proof or, or the four color problem, not the proof yet, but the problem is uh, its formulation in the language of graphs. A map can always be seen as or translated into a graph with a vertex for each region and an edge for each pair of regions sharing a border. As we can see in the maps of Brazil and India here in the slide. Uh, this representation of a map makes the use of uh, computers in the proof possible. The graph's internal relations can be translated into the language of matrices which allows for the implementation of the algorithmic um, will, uh, of the algorithms for constructing cases uh, in, in, in computer machines. As the first original mathematical result obtained through a peculiarly mass massive use of computational machinery, the proof of the four color theorem that from now on I will call just the proof uh, generated a, a storm of publicity. Really like New York Times, Science Magazine, everywhere. Uh, it was really a, a phenomena, a mediatic phenomena. The, the publication, uh, the University of Illinois even made a, um, 
stamp to commemorate that poems was were written. It was a really something. Um, so and and the reactions were 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 disparate uh, within the mathematical community. Some computer science too, and of course a good amount of philosophical commentary followed the sensational popularization of the result, uh, as which I will uh, discuss in a minute. In both texts and events publicizing the the four color theorem and in the philosophical discussions, the focus during the last four decades or so had been in the massive use of computers on how crucial steps of the proof were verified with the use of about 1200 hours of computer time and would be extremely consuming, uh, time consuming to verify by hand. This is in a paper by the authors of the proof, Appel and Hacken, uh, the paper written um, almost 10 years later, uh, after the publication, <clears throat> the proof is um, is has the general strategy of a, um, a proof by contradiction, okay? And it, as, as many other proofs in graph theory, includes a proof by cases. So you need to exhaust all the cases of the uh, dilemmas that you need to prove. Um, and this is the this is the general idea. So and 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 this strategy is implemented in two steps. First, you need to construct um, a set of configurations from which at least one is present in every map, and then you show that this set of configurations has a certain property, and it is in these showing that the this set has all the all the um, um, configurations in this set had this, this property that computers enters to make all these calculations. Okay, so in the second part of the proof that uh, is this that they are referring here with the amount of time and, and, and things, but also the proof uh, computers were used heuristically in the first part of the proof, but in the end they made it by hand, everything uh, by hand regarding the first part uh, of the proof. So even today, whenever computer assisted mathematics is considered historically or philosophically, the proof is mentioned in association with a seminal paper by Thomas Timosko from 79. So the proof was published in 77. Uh, and the first philosophical reaction, also the tale goes, is Timosko's paper. And I talk about the tale because that's not true. In fact, in 77, right after the announcement of the proof, uh, Georg Kreiser wrote a paper um, about his project of uh, uh, justifying and unwinding proofs. And then he mentioned and he commented on the, the, the four color theorem proof, but he doesn't, um, no one talks about it. Also, how Wang uh, gave a series of lectures in 77 in Beijing and it published in 81, an entire chapter on computers and mathematics commenting on, and also no one talks about it, but okay. So, but, so the point is that the philosophical debate was uh, always responding to, to Moscow 79 paper, a conceptual move that demands critical attention because it entirely ignores two significant aspects of the proof, as I will show. Since Chimosko's work on the epistemological status of computer-assisted mathematics has defined subsequent uh, discussion, we should give a look at his main argument, focusing on one specific point. And for this, my panorama a la Provitz will help. Why? Because it's you know, a huge bibliography I already worked on it. So today I'm just focusing and I'm using Pravit's uh, strategy to reconstruct the debate because it's economic, it's short, uh, not because I agree with the way he does, but because it's, it's easy to see the, the, the debate. So the question um, uh, that uh, Pravitz uses to organize the debate is this, does, the, does this proof uh, uh, introduce significant conceptual changes regarding mathematics? Because if, if it does, then of course this will have epistemological and philosophical consequences, right? And the response that Timosko in the seminal paper gives is of course, yes. Uh, he does that through an argument that I call the argument for introduction of uh, argumentation in mathematics that according to him will, in the end, force uh, uh, the result and this argument will show 
that we are forced to, revi to revise many commonly held beliefs about mathematics, such as all mathematical theorems are known uh, a priori, mathematics as opposed to computer science has no empirical content, mathematics as opposed to natural science has um, use, uh, rely on proofs, relies on proofs and, 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 and natural science in, in experiments. And also that mathematical theorems are certain to a degree that no theorem of natural science can reach. Considering uh, the proof as a hybrid or a limiting case or a limiting procedure between mathematics, mathematical proofs and, and computer uh, and, and experiments in, in natural sciences, Chimosco makes the case for regarding the proof as a bridge connecting uh, the poles of traditional dualisms underlying those claims. Necessity analytic connections and independent of experience on the one hand and contingency non-analytic uh, connections and dependence of experience in the other hand. His main conclusion calls into question the demarcation between mathematics and the natural sciences, a topic uh, with with echoes, not only in the first rejoinders to Chimosco's paper, but also in contemporary philosophy of mathematics and some uh, approaches in philosophy of computer sciences. Uh, this morning, Hoot was talking about the boxes of the traditional uh, organization of, of, of knowledge. And uh, one, of the, the, one of the things that I find problematic still nowadays is that people are still responding to Chimosco in terms of the demarcation problem. Uh, and, you know, the world changes, the discipline changes, and then maybe we should not be that concerned with demarcation problems, but that's another talk. Uh, his argument, um, so here's just other participants in the debate. The most curious one for me is Stuart Schenker that said that it was not a proof, it was an experiment. Um, the argument, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, going into the details of uh, Chimosco's argument, I do, but just the two first premises. <clears throat> he says, look, traditionally proofs are characterized by these three feature, features. They, they convince, they are surveyable, and they are formalizable. But the four-color theorem proof, although it is convincible, it, it has the capacity to convince, which is contentions because you know it took some time and even nowadays people there are people saying that is not a proof, uh, but he says it convinces it is formalizable, but it's not surveyable because computers did part of the job, right? So this is the premise that I'm focusing in because it's very problematic. So the argument goes, uh, the four-color theorem proof represents a completely new event uh, in the universe of mathematical practices because it is the first case of a posteriori necessary proposition that introduces then philosophical, philosophically significant changes in the mathematics and of course in philosophy too, because then now mathematics can be, you know, errors can appear in proofs, so it's not proofs, it's experiments and so on and so forth. Now, the seminal argument of this, here's Schenker, Stuart Schenker saying in the name of Wittgenstein that is not even a proof, it's just an experiment. Uh, okay. But the seminal argument by Chimosco uh, have, as I said, many problems. To begin with, he doesn't clarify or he doesn't give evidence enough for this characterization of proof. Where, where does it come from that proof is convincible and uh, surveyable and formalizable. Also, um, and, and, and this is the second uh, point is very important for all the debate that followed. Um, he associates the non-surveyability of the proof with the use of computers, saying that using computers, we have experimental uh, 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 elements coming into the proof. But it, it's not clear how the experimental character has to do with the non-surveyability, so it's a mess. The problem also with the notion of surveyability because he's ambiguous, sometimes he talks about the step-by-step -step algorithmic uh, uh, surveyability. Sometimes it seems like he is talking about this bird's eye view. Uh, and um, so I'm, I'm, I used uh, Bassler distinctions here between global and local surveyability. A third problem is that um, he considers that computation, he considers computation as a sort of black box, 
right? So we don't know what's going on inside the computer, so <laughs> we cannot trust it. And these problems are related with his methodological uh, approach, right, to the proof. Mm, the way he reconstructs the logical, conceptual, and technical procedures in the proof. Although his description is not wrong, he, he even goes into some details, mathematical details, and uh, it, it is okay in this general sense, he does not show enough familiarity with the vocabulary or the procedures used within the computer science of his time. Nowhere does he, analyzes the, does he analyze the crucial notions of algorithm and program, much less discuss the specificities of programming language used in the design of the algorithm and its relation to the memory capacity of the machines or the amount of time demanded for, computer, for, for, for the calculations. Thus, the first task in my new approach to the problem is to give a detailed account of the computational elements of the proof, both in their symbolic and in their material aspects. Again, the algorithm, programming languages, mechanical aspects of the devices, the division of labor that, that occurred in the processes. This will allow me to distinguish the different roles of computers in the proof more precisely, because it, as I said before, there was also the, um, the um, heuristic uh, role of the computers, not only the justificatory, if you like this distinction. And um, so yeah, the different roles of computers and um, where am I? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> In the symbolic and, and, and algorithmic aspects and uh, pre provide me, uh, allow me to provide a more distinct picture of the type of practice performed by the actors involved in the processes, whether mathematicians or engineers, as well as the dynamics in their interactions, interactions between engineers and mathematicians and between them and the machines. Only after one has scrutinized carefully the computational processes involved in the proof, it will be possible to respond to the question that Pravitz himself did not respond. He, put, he, he puts the question about, is it, does it amount to a, new, a shift of paradigm in, in mathematics? But uh, he, he finishes his paper without answering to it. And my answer is that, uh, yes, but not in terms of paradigm. I, I like more the, the concept of culture and I'll talk to you about it in a minute. So this, this uh, strategy that I am now uh, thinking of is in itself constitutes a change in perspective in relation to the ways in which the proof is often mentioned in historical and, and philosophical contexts. Opening the black box of the algorithmic processes <clears throat> is a change in, in, in the methodological point of view because it implies that the researcher does not merely describe as an observer the reconstructed practices from a third person perspective or standpoint, but as an actor in her context with her aim in a first person perspective, which by its turn is the only perspective from which that maker knowledge, maker's knowledge uh, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk is possible. And this maker knowledge is lacking for every one of us, massively lacking in our everyday lives with respect to the algorithms that rule the world. But there is more. I told you before that the philosophical focus on the four color uh, theorem proof during the last four decades or so had been in the massive use of computer calculations on how crucial steps of the proof were verified, blah, blah, blah. But even after so much printed ink, a historically accurate first person reconstruction of the material culture in which the theorem was proved is still lacking. Another crucial aspect of the proof that has not been examined is the fact that it contains 50 pages containing texts and diagrams, 85 pages filled with almost 2,500 additional diagrams and 400 microfiche pages that contain further diagrams and thousands of individual verifications of claims made in the 24 lemmas in the main section of the text. So everyone paid attention to computers, and no one until now paid attention to how 
this element, very significant element in the proof diagrams work. Uh, so it's interesting if you go back to that, that, that the, the beginning, right? I never saw a picture of Apple, Apple in Haken with the computers. The pictures that they chose, like this one here for the, uh, oops, I'm sorry, for the, um, the, their propaganda has them looking at diagrams. So if, we could, if you could see that many, many diagrams in the picture, right? <laughs> Interesting. And uh, just a quick look in the first se sessions of the first part of the paper, we will see that diagrams are used to specify vertices of graphs, to define procedures, to establish exceptions to definitions, to define, I love this expression, to define by drawing some configurations, to explain abbreviations, etc. So as I said, a lot of work to do. Given the amount of philosophical work being done in the field of visual reasoning and diagrams in mathematics, especially in the field of philosophy of mathematical practice, this is a remarkable omission. I must recognize though that I myself colluded with this uh, omission until I met an extraordinary historian of mathematics Karin Shemla, whose impact in my life is only comparable to the impact caused by my belated contact with feminist philosophers such as Naomi Shiman and the historians of philosophy that I now revere, such as Sarah Hutton, Mary Ellen Waite, Ruth Hagenruber, and others. But before concluding with some of the lessons I have learned from the history of philosophy and mathematics, I'm going to talk about women and diagrams in the history of my case study. Because in omitting the substantial role of diagrams in the proof, in its construction and in its final text, historians and philosophers of mathematics have also neglected the role of two crucial performers considered Mary, merely uh, as supporting actresses in the history of the proof. Laurel Appel and Dorothea Haken, now Dorothea Blostein, Appel and Haken's daughters. Both are usually mentioned in the historical approaches and in the sociological analysis made by Donald McKenzie as having helped their fathers in the huge and tedious hand-checking tasks that were necessary, Mackenzie's word. Laurel Appel, uh, and, and I'm gonna show you this slide. This slide was made by her brother, Andrew Appel, or Appel, which is uh, now a computer scientist. And then this is from his presentation on the Four Color Fest that happened in the University of Illinois in 2017. And then he made, I knew about that before, but it's interesting that when I found it, uh, he made the correction to, for example, Robin Wilson, the great uh, mathematician and historian of mathematics that wrote this, one of the most uh, uh, um, accurate historical books about it. Everyone, as Wilson said, that Appel and Haken, they put the family to work. And then, <laughs> and then Andrew said, no, 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 it was only the girls. So uh, Laurel uh, Appel, who was a biology professor, she uh, passed away in 2013. Uh, and, and this is attested in, uh, in an interview that Haken gave to Mackenzie. She found and corrected errors in about the 700 pages of the manuscripts. Dorothea Blostein, who is now a computer science scientist working with uh, graphics recognition and document classification among other extraordinary topics, is a professor at the School of Computing at Queen's University, Canada. And in the 70s, she was a graduate student in computer science and was responsible for drawing and checking the diagrams contained in the manuscript, as well as the supplements containing thousands and thousands of diagrams. But of course you could ask, in which sense these facts can be relevant to the historical reconstruction of the context in which the proof was constructed. 
By mentioning the historical ignorance about the auxiliary work of two young women university students in their father's constructions of a mathematical proof, I'm not suggesting that they were oppressed, much less claiming that a new history of the four-color theorem proof must be written from the point of view of women, to the justice to those who actively participated in the intellectual practices in certain contexts, not least because I still didn't have the opportunity to interview Professor Blostein. It's in the agenda. What I found relevant to highlight here today in this symposium on how we think and how we think and imagine the connections between our past and our future is that at least for the microhistory that I am currently interested in, the call to reopen a seemingly closed chapter of history do not necessarily come from the imposition of an agenda directly related to gender issues. In my case, the need to re-examine the history of a mathematical event came from the desire to better understand a specific conceptual question about the identity of computer-assisted proofs. This is why I came to France last year. This was my project. I was interested in the fact that there are, you know, we have the 77 proof, I'm talking only about this, but then we have other proofs. The last one by Gontier is completely formalized. So these three proofs have the same, the, the, the same uh, general strategy, but not the same computational machinery is in question. And then I thought, well, if I want to discuss the identity of these proofs, I need to look at the, computa com to the computational machinery, but also how diagrams participate in it. And then I came to France and then I've met Karine and then my life changed. So uh, that was my question initially. When I, when I realized in dialogue with Karine that to compare the proofs that were produced after the one that I already knew, I needed to go back to the past and write a better, a genuine history of the four-color theorem proof free from the historical imprecisions, as well as the conceptual and historiographical problems resulting from all sorts of, of biases and false assumptions. In realizing this, I came to understand that the new corrected and improved version of the history I am interested or in, and I am already writing will include the decisive participation of women who had hitherto been barely mentioned. Does this sound familiar? Let me now close uh, the talk with a few lessons that the historians of mathematics and philosophy that I have been mentioning have together taught me. On the side of philosophy, many of us had, have had the privilege of witnessing its history being reshaped into a new, revised and corrected version in this version, or in this new version of the history, the intellectual fortuna of women, to use Sarah Hutton's uh, expression, of human, but also of minorities and sometimes even cultures from entire regions of the world that were excluded from the canon. In this, in this, in this uh, new history, these are evaluated in their own contexts and investigated according to their many specificities by means of methodologies that diversify and expand beyond those implemented in the making of the exclusionary and enormously homogeneous global or local canons. Witnessing, say, Mary Ellen Waite argue for, with her energy and humor as it, she did on Sunday, the need for a female detective methodology or hearing Ruth Hagenhuber's often vigorously reminder that, I quote, the history of philosophy that we are traditionally educated in the Western world is simply not true to the facts, end of quote, is for us an invitation to participate in this challenging endeavor. And this is one lesson that I've learned. It's good, it's better, come with us. <laughs> On the side of mathematics, not being a mathematician, but um, a curious philosopher, well-trained in logic, I have recently become acquainted with work that is reshaping the history of mathematics. In fact, the history of numbers. 
into a new, revised, and corrected version. One version in which, the, in which faithfulness to the diversity of historical processes encompassing mathematical practices in different regions of the ancient world, Mesopotamia, China, and South Africa, demand methodologies that diversify and expand beyond the, those, uh, blah, 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 and expand beyond those implemented in the making, I'm sorry. Oh, the canon, the canon, the mathematical canon. Here, here the question is the analogy, right? As uh, I, I'm learning with, uh, I'm learning how to do better flows of, of, of history of philosophy and mathematics. And this book that will be soon published uh, by Karin Schemla um, and Proust uh, about the, the ancient mathematics in Mesopotamia, right? Challenges the, the mathematical canon, this idea that it, the, the canon, it is a norm for the narrative that mathematics proper, mathematics, mathematics, was a Greek miracle bequeathed to the West, a unique and unprecedented collection of knowledge with no parallel in Eastern cultures and the homogenization of Eastern cultures, Mesopotamian, China, and, and South Asian, as it was just this mass of different people from Europeans. These cultures with no abstraction, no universality, no logic, no philosophy, no mathematical proofs, only algorithms. But as pointed out by Karine Shemla in one of the earliest papers that she wrote about it in uh, 87, one of the peculiarities of algorithmic mathematics, the mathematics of Mesopotamians, China, that has this character of being algorithmic, uh, Sometimes, sometimes also called, um, sometimes also called blind thought, is precisely that the integration of different algorithms in some corpus is not realized by way of generalizing abstraction, but it gives a concrete basis to the construction of some mathematical entities, and the particular context in which those bases exist are the soil of what is called mathematical culture, or a shared way of doing mathematics. Question, are there similarities between this ancient algorithmic mathematics and the contemporary computer assisted one? I only have more one paragraph and I'm gonna finish. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, three more minutes. I'm this not question. happy to interrupt you. Yeah. Okay, so the, uh, so the question, and I will answer and finish is, are there similarities between this ancient algorithmic mathematics and the contemporary computer assisted one? This question is now motivating me to reconstruct the web of interrelations uh, between the material conditions and the algorithmic practices, the computational culture, in which the proof of the four color theorem came into being. And as I said, to investigate the variety of roles of diagrams have in the proof, in fact, the interplay between algorithms and diagrams, machines and humans in the rise of a new computer assisted mathematical culture. Some must be envisioning the end of the mathematical world as we know it. Because computers are highly complex and hybrid artifacts. So <laughs> the end of the world as we know it, maybe, maybe another beginning because computers are highly complex and hybrid artifacts. Any initiative to know how they work and impact human practices such as the doing and teaching of mathematics will demand highly detailed inter and maybe transdisciplinary investigations. My hope for the future is that the research I told you about today will be an appropriate contribution to this broader enterprise insofar as it proposes a careful and cross-reference reconstruction of a mathematical event whose particularities are not as well known as its existence. May this historical philosophical reconstruction engender new ways of uh, understanding constitutive aspects of our ever-growing computer-dependent but nevertheless, human world.
Dankeschön. Wonderful.